Everybody good? You having a good week? Staying warm? Just having a conversation about how it was 70 on Friday, 29 today. So that's fun. A little whiplash, good stuff. Speaking of whiplash, have you ever met somebody that you didn't know how to interact with them? You didn't know how to talk to them, you didn't know how to engage them, you, you felt like you had to be somebody else around them, and so you just felt uncomfortable. You guys probably aren't like that. I'm probably the only insecure one around. But uh, it, it can be intimidating, right? Maybe uh, when I worked at Kroger, uh, we would have like the VP come in and visit, and so like the store would get really clean, and, and we would all have to tuck our shirts in and make sure we had the right name tags on and all this stuff. And then as soon as he was out the door, we were all like, Woo! It's completely different, right? Sometimes we don't know how to act around certain people. You meet somebody, like if you meet the queen, apparently there's like protocol for meeting Queen, queen Elizabeth. So you have to walk a certain way, say certain things. When you meet somebody, you're not sure how to interact with them. It makes us feel uncomfortable. Even somebody that we're supposed to know, even somebody who we're supposed to maybe draw close to. And I think this is one of the issues we have in prayer. We're in a series right now about prayer and about looking at the, at the Lord's Prayer that we just recited together. And so we started last week with our Father. This week we're talking about hallowed be your name, which is really just another way of saying like, God, make your name holy. God, make your name holy. And so when we read our Father, when we pray to our Father, we're like, yeah, I like that God. I, I, I feel close to him. I feel like I wanna, wanna be next to him. And then we read, make your name holy, and we're like, but not too close, because he's different than me. That holiness thing scares us, because we understand that there's a difference. We can't treat God as common. There's something sacred there. So what I want us to do today is I want us to look at Isaiah chapter 6, and the reason why we're looking at Isaiah 6 is because it's one of the best uh, pictures of an interaction between somebody and coming up against God's holiness, confronting it directly. So we're looking at Isaiah chapter 6, and we're also going to start obviously in Matthew chapter 6 where you see the Lord's Prayer. And I want us to talk about how we can actually pray to a God that's holy. How it's not something that we should be repulsed by or afraid of, but rather something that should draw us in to prayer with the Lord. So we're going to see two things that we should consider, and then one thing we should continue to do. So first, let's consider his character. Let's consider his character. So we pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Make your name holy, which seems like a contradiction because isn't God's name already holy? Like, why do I have to ask him to do something for something that's already the way it is, right? It's like, dog, God, make this dog bark. Lord, please make this cat meow. Why would, it doesn't make sense. Maybe a better question is why do we feel the need to treat God's name as holy at all? Like, why is that? Why is the name of God so sacred? It's just letters put together. They're just syllables, sounds that you make with your mouth. And you can tell it's sacred. It's even sacred to people that don't believe in God because if you wanna make profanity even worse, you add God's name to it. If you wanna upgrade your cursing game, just heads up, fun, fun facts from your pastor, Insert God's name into your profanity. It immediately becomes worse. That's how you get actually beeped out on TV. There's this inherent understanding that God's name is sacred. Why? Why is a name, a word, sacred? The answer is because God is holy. And whatever he gives us is also holy. And he's given us his name. He's given us his name. We don't live in an era anymore where you, address, unless you're like under the age of 12, you don't really address somebody by Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. You pretty much immediately enter into first name relationships with pretty much everybody. Probably even your bosses at work desire you to call them by their first name. They don't want you to treat them any more common than that. But we're pretty much on a first name basis with everybody. So there's a little bit of this luster lost on us, but you are on a first name basis with the creator of the universe. He has given you his name. In Exodus, he reveals his name to be Yahweh. In the Gospels, 
The Son of God goes by the name Jesus, and he still answers to the name Jesus. He gives you his name. It's something that is sacred and holy. And the reason why this is so important is because it's how we actually lay hold of God. It's how we actually get his attention. We don't do magical incantations. We don't dance. We don't uh, do spells. We don't do sacrifices. We're Baptists. We don't do anything. We just say the name of Jesus. We just say the name of God. And that's how we get his attention. We cry out, God help me. And he answers. He listens. He hears. It's why when we pray, we say what? In Jesus' name. Now, some of us think that acts like a postage stamp that like makes the prayer deliverable. Like it'll get returned to sender if you don't say in Jesus' name. So we, we, we get really, or in his name, it's also acceptable postage. It's not how it works. It's how we lay hold of who God is. And this is why we have to consider his character. Because his name that he gives us There's a character behind it. There's a person behind it. And any interaction with God that minimizes his holiness, which is a temptation of ours, because we like Father God. We like cuddly Jesus. We like the loving Jesus. We're afraid of holy Jesus. We're afraid of Mount of Transfiguration Jesus. But any attempt to minimize that, you're not praying to God anymore. You're you're praying to an idol that you've constructed for yourself, one that seems approachable by you in your flaws and in your weaknesses. So Isaiah finds himself in in a bit of a pickle, experiencing God's glory, and it's terrifying. Look at Isaiah chapter six, verse one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. What an absolutely terrifying description. That's horrifying. And I think because we're reading it and it's so amazing, we miss the very first phrase, in the year King Uzziah died. It's important. It's important for what we're talking about today. Who was King Uzziah? Uzziah was a king of Judah towards the end of Judah's existence as a separate independent nation. And he was a decent king. He was a good king as far as kings from Judah went. He was no David, but he was good. And about 11 years before his reign ended, he was struck with leprosy. Such a bad case of leprosy that he was quarantined. He basically ran the kingdom of Judah via Zoom for 11 years. And it was so bad, he wasn't able to go to the temple He wasn't able to go to the palace. He was by himself, and he co-reigned with his son, Jotham, for 11 years. Jotham was a good king, too. After that, things kind of go downhill. And he dies. And in in, in Jewish culture and uh, according to the law, if you died with leprosy, there was a curse there. God was mad at you about something. That was ancient understanding of diseases. If you died from something like that, with something like that, God was mad. And so in Isaiah's perspective, you've got Assyria becoming this giant empire that's brutally cruel. You've got the nation of Israel, which never follows God from the moment it starts. And then you've got Judah, which a lot of people think is actually the junior of the two kingdoms. And Isaiah's looking at everything. He's like, God, why are you letting all this stuff happen? Why is all this bad stuff happening? Have you forgotten us? Have you forgotten your promises to us? Are you abandoning us? Isaiah's a lot like Job. He's wondering what's gonna happen. Why is God doing this? And God, who is consistent, answers Isaiah the same way he answers Job. He shows up. He doesn't answer any of Isaiah's questions. He doesn't say, this is why Uzziah had leprosy. He doesn't say, this is why, what I'm doing with Assyria. He doesn't do any of that. You know what he says? He just shows up. And he doesn't say much at all. 
not beginning. It's his angels, the seraphim, who are saying something. Job, it happens the same way. He doesn't answer any of Job's questions. God just says, I've got questions for you. And Job is satisfied with the presence of God. Isaiah is satisfied with the presence of God. When we question God's character, when we question his promises, we question what he's about, the best thing that God can give you is not an answer, mostly because God doesn't answer to you or to me. The best thing he can give you is his presence. That's what you want. And so when God's character is called into question, he shows up. He makes his appearance. He shows his holiness, his perfections, his completeness. That's what holiness is. His perfection, his otherness. He's the most God, Godness that God can be. That's what his holiness is. He's the benchmark of holiness. And he shows up, and it is scary. It says that his robe fills the temple. Now, when we read this, we think, like, oh, there's a lot of God everywhere. No, 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 no. Like, he has filled the temple. So Isaiah is uncomfortably close to God. Have you ever talked to somebody who talks really close? And you're like backing away and they keep chasing you? They don't know they're doing it, but they're doing it. If this has never happened to you, guess what? You're the close talker. <laughs> it's you. Just take a step back. Social distancing has been very good for everyone. Or if you've ever been in an elevator with like really important people, or you've been in an, important, uh, an elevator with, with very muscular people, and you're smaller, skinnier, and you're like, I just wanna get off this elevator. This is brutally uncomfortable. If you wanna mess with people on an elevator, by the way, walk in and don't turn and face the door. Just keep staring back. <laughs> it unsettles everyone. You will have the upper hand then, no matter who's in there. <laughs> Isaiah is uncomfortably close to God, like touching him, uncomfortable. And on top of that, to add to the effect, there's these two angels flying around. And these are not your grandmother's precious moment angels. These are monsters. This is like terrifying creatures. They've got six wings. What are they hiding? Why are they covering themselves up so much? They're scary. And then, to top it all off, one of them flies towards Isaiah with a hot coal. All I can picture is if it was me, I'd just be like, ah. Fortunately, God explains what's happening. Gary Smith says this, holiness is the essence of God's nature and God himself is the supreme revelation of holiness. God's holiness reveals how separate, different, and totally other he is in comparison with the created world. I say he's scared and has every right to be because he is encountering something that is completely unlike himself. Imagine like meeting a space alien. That's what's going on here. This, this, this being is so much greater, so much more powerful, and so much better. There's a great gap between me and this being that I'm meeting in this temple right now. Job asks, who am I to question God? Isaiah asks, nothing. He just laments the fact that he is somebody who has said wrong things, done wrong things, spoken ill of people, hateful speech, blasphemies about God, and what's more is he lives amongst people that do the exact same thing, and he apparently has been very okay with it. And we know Jesus teaches what? Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So this is what's going on in Isaiah's heart. He knows he's been fully exposed for not being, and Isaiah's a righteous man. He's a good guy. And he's left scared to death because of God's holiness. But God in his grace approaches Isaiah. He brings him into worship. Isaiah doesn't ask for any of this. Isaiah's not like, God, I want to participate. Please let me. No, God answers. God stops his own worship. He reduces his own worship so that Isaiah can be brought in. The seraphim stops singing to go bring God in. What I, my favorite part of the whole thing is that God actually explains what he's doing. He says, this coal has touched your lips, you're clean. He doesn't leave Isaiah to figure it out because he desires fellowship with Isaiah. He wants Isaiah to be close to him. He doesn't want Isaiah to be uncomfortable around him. He wants to put him at ease, right? Because God is a gracious God. The temptation is to be distracted by the holiness. And obviously there's a lot of it going on, but it's also God's grace on display. And 
that's why you can't look at God's holiness as something that's antithetical to his love. We have a tendency to do this. We tend to like loving God and be scared of holy God, right? This is why people divide the Bible into the Old Testament and New Testament mentally, right? God in the Old Testament is holy and scary and burning things. And God in the New Testament is loving and kind and dying for us. Same God. And his holiness is essential to the New Testament God you like. His holiness is essential to being the God you like. Here's why. Because God's holiness means that he's not like us. So when I love something or I love somebody, it's because it does something for me. I love things that taste good. I love things that look good. I love things that make me feel happy. I hate things that don't make me feel happy. I don't like people that aren't like me, right? Naturally, we gravitate towards people that act like us, think like us, do things like us, and have our opinions, or at the very least, amuse us. Even if we don't like them, we're like, well, they're funny. But for me to love somebody that's not like me, it takes effort, it takes work, it's a challenge. If God's love was like our love, if it was not holy love, something other than, something different than, God would only love that which is of himself, that which is himself. God would only love that which is like him, which is only one thing, him. But God doesn't just love himself. He loves himself, sure, which is good for us. That's a whole other topic. But God also very much loves us. The love of God, this holy love, this holiness that we're so afraid of, fuels the very love that reaches out to his enemies and that brings them close, that reaches out to the wounded. And rather than pulverizing and destroying them, raises them up, forgives them, is merciful to them. Because God's love is not like our love because it's a holy love. Our love is impure. It's imperfect. It's self-interested. It's being purified. This is why Jesus Christ pays the price for us. Because God's holiness and God's love both have to be satisfied. You notice when Isaiah says, oh, woe is me, God doesn't say, dude, don't worry. It's all right. No worries, bro. No worries. That's a different translation. No, God addresses it directly. He directly addresses it. He doesn't let it go by the wayside. He presents the burning coal. There's nothing magical about the burning coal. It's the proclamation by God. The statement of faith by Isaiah. There's grace involved. You see, all the things that we feel, the fear, the anxiety, the worry that God's gonna find us out, that, that we have to, to hide from God because of his holiness. This is, what, by the way, why Adam and Eve get clothes. That's why they decide to open up fig leaves are us. Because they were hiding. They were exposed to God and to each other. God, on the other hand, sees through it all. And we're afraid. We're still afraid. But God doesn't want us to be afraid. Not like that. And so he sends his son. And all the things we feel, the fear, the, the worry that God's going to resent us, the worry that God's going to destroy us, the, 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 the concern that God's going to accept other people but not us, that we're not enough, all that stuff gets put on Jesus Christ. Everything we deserve because of God's holiness gets put on Jesus Christ. He's crushed. He's pulverized. He's killed. And when we put our faith in Christ... We fall under the shelter of his grace and now we can draw close. Isaiah had a burning coal, we get a bloody cross. Because the burning coal is just a symbol, it's just a sign that points to a greater redemption, a greater act coming later, which is the person and work of Jesus Christ. If you are not in Christ, if you do not have faith in him, if your hope for a relationship with God does not revolve around the person and work of Jesus Christ, this may be hard for you to hear, but you should be afraid of God's holiness. Because you are an enemy of God. But he doesn't want you to stay that way. And I don't either. You have an opportunity today to fall under the banner, to fall under the blood of Christ. And for God to welcome you. He's holding out a burning coal to you today. Will you take it? Will you be like Isaiah? Isaiah? Will you take it?
Because when you've done that, you get invited into fellowship with God. And it's not holy, holy, holy three times. That's not what fellowship with God is. We're much more complicated than that. You're called to consider, to contemplate who God is. This beautiful thing. You get to think about this beautiful person, this beautiful entity. You don't have to fear being caught with unclean lips and unclean thoughts. Yeah, you should grow and mature and leave some of that stuff behind. As much as God allows you to grow in that grace, absolutely. But we don't have to worry about being like, oh, well, God doesn't want anything to do with me because I I had a lustful thought the other day. No. God doesn't want anything to do with me because he must be so disappointed. No. All that's on Jesus Christ. It's not on you anymore. If you are in him, if you have faith in him, And so now you're free. You're free to draw close to this God that made us uncomfortable before. You're free to enjoy his fellowship. You're free to be a part of a relationship with him. You're free to even deconstruct your faith because all of us have things in our lives, stuff in our past that need a little deconstruction. You're free to do that and trust that Christ will lead you through that process. We wanna help you through that process. You're free to rest in Christ. Whatever burdens you have, you can lay aside. You can give to him. He's not gonna reject you because you're too much. Worship becomes your life when you are in Christ, when you recognize and love the fact that God is holy, but he loves you. It it becomes a lifetime of considering who he is. If God is holy, if you're gonna pray to a God that's holy, that's really what we're trying to talk about today is how do, we, how do we pray to a God that's holy? You've got to spend a lot of time contemplating who he is, which we don't like to do because we're busy. We want to do stuff. But if you're going to treat God as holy, you've got to contemplate. You've got to think about who he is. You've got to consider it by scripture, by community, by prayer. This is why we have the chapel open Monday through Fridays from 11 to 1. To come in and in community, contemplate, consider who God is in the silence. You consider it just by thinking about God. I had this happen to me. I went to take a nap a couple Sundays ago. Maybe it was last Sunday. I can't remember. It was a good nap. But I was thinking about how busy I was on Sunday and how I was running around and doing all this other stuff. And and I just didn't have a chance to worship, to really contemplate God. Because Sunday mornings, I'm busy. And so as I was laying down, I was struck by this. I was like, golly, because it was finally the first time I'd gotten to slow down. And so I was like, I want to contemplate God. So I started thinking about God, and I was like, God, thank you so much for being holy. Thank you for being kind. Thank you for being gracious. Thank you, thank you. And then I I realized, I was like, I'm not contemplating God at all. I'm going down a menu of theological names and terms that I know applies to God, and I'm thanking him for them, which is fine, but it's not contemplating him. In the same way that knowing what's on a hamburger isn't enjoying the hamburger. And so I just stopped and I kind of closed my eyes and I just kind of savored who God is without really like slapping terms on it, just being like, this is what it is to enjoy God's holiness. Just kind of letting my mind wander to the truths about God that I know, almost like you would walk through a park or walk through a field and you would come upon like a flower and be like, oh, that's cool or oh, go look at that. And so I kind of let my mind just kind of wander freely being like, oh, like God is kind. And I kind of enjoyed that for a while, and then I'd I'd move on to the next thing, and before I know it, I was asleep. It was a great nap. It really was. Contemplating God is not necessarily the most linear thing you will do. But it's worth it. It's worth your time. So we need to consider his character. Contemplate who he is. But we also need to consider his commands. We need to consider his command. Look at verse 8. Verse eight, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. Wow, Isaiah went from, I am not even cool enough to be around you to I want a job. Like dramatic turn here. It's because he believes what God has said about him. He's trusting that God has accepted him. And he doesn't even know what the job is, but he says, pick me, pick me. And let's see what the job is. Verse nine, and he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So the job is this. You're gonna talk and proclaim the words of God so much, Isaiah 
to the point where nobody will even listen to you anymore. They're going to get so tired of hearing from you that they'll just ignore you. Isaiah agrees to have a terrible job for the rest of his life. And again, he doesn't even know what the job is. And he says, hey, send me. I want to I wanna do this. I mean, imagine going and being interviewed for a job, getting hired, walking in on day one and being like, no, what do we do again? Like, what's the company? Who? What do we sell? What's the difference? Why is Isaiah so quick to do a job that he knows nothing about? You know why he's so quick? It's not about the job. It's about who he gets to work for. It's about God. I can serve the Lord If your favorite boss or the company you think the highest of was hiring, wouldn't you at least consider any opening they had because of the relationship there? There's a reason why people, why why young high school graduates decide to go all the way to Tuscaloosa, Alabama to play football. And it's not because Tuscaloosa is cool. I drive through it. It is not. It's because people want to play. Sorry, Jay. It's because people want to play for Coach Saban. It's an opportunity. There'll be a backup quarterback just so they can be around that guy. Isaiah has a chance to play for the Lord Almighty and he's not gonna pass it up no matter what he wants him to do. This is what happens when you pray to God, when you pray to a set aside holy God. This contemplation that you have changes from who is this God to what does he want me to do? What does he want me to do? What action does he want me to take? We started this by saying, how do I pray to a holy God? And one of the things that you'll realize is God's gonna ask something of you. As we consider his character, this desire to serve him should spring up. And if it doesn't, you haven't considered his character long enough. Continue to consider his character. This is what happens in Psalm 116. The psalmist reflects on God's mercy, his grace, all these things. And then in the message translation or paraphrase, he says, starting in verse 11, what can I give back to God for the blessings he's poured out on me? I'll lift high the cup of salvation, a toast to God. I'll pray in the name of God. I'll complete what I promise God I do and do it with his people. He's not saying, what can I give back to God so I can earn my salvation? I can pay God back. No, 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 no. He's saying, what can I give back to God as an acknowledgement, as a thank you, as a toast. I wanna raise my glass to God. And then he says, I'm gonna serve him, and I'm gonna serve him with God's people. This is what we've done with Concord Church. This isn't just one person in our church that was like, hey, we should go partner with Concord. It wasn't just staff leadership that thought that either. There were numerous people. The Spirit of God worked and moved through several people in our church. And some of this looked like Some folks saying, hey, we should plant a church with Concord. We should work with Concord in some way. And God in his grace, today, actually, a church called Epic Church Fellowship, led by Dr. Marlo McGuire, is starting today at 3.30 p.m. And Jeff's gonna be there to help open it up. This is what we do. When we asked, what can we give back to God for the blessings he's poured out on me, on us, God said, I want you to partner with Concord Church. I don't know what it'll be for you personally, but we have not considered God's holiness truly until we get to a step of compliance. If you're gonna pray to a holy God, your agenda has to fall by the wayside, and here's why. When we go to God, what are we seeking? Often we're seeking mercy, we're seeking comfort, we're seeking guidance, of course, we're seeking all those things. But the reason why you want those things from God is because he's not like anybody else. He's holy. His guidance is holy. His comfort is holy. His mercy is holy. I can get guidance, mercy, and comfort from anybody. But the one that God gives is so different. It's so unique. It's so special. When you go to God and you're actually seeking his comfort, what you really want is his holiness. When you want his mercy, you really want his holy mercy, his holy forgiveness, his holy love. You're after something only God can provide because he's holy. But remember, with God's perspective, when we go to God, there will be change. There'll be an ask to change in your life because you're different than God. 
Our, our job is to get on God's agenda, not ours, not to bring him onto ours. And so if we go to God and we contemplate his holiness, and there's not a call to change, and there's not a change of our perspective, we've not prayed to a holy God, we've prayed to ourselves. Contemplative prayer, again, is necessary. We have to know what God wants of us. We have to know what he expects after you consider his character. What does he want? What can I do for you, Lord? What do you want me to do in this fight that I've had with a friend or a spouse? You want me to seek forgiveness? I haven't done anything wrong. God says I don't care. Go and apologize. What, is, what kind of a job does God want me to have? What about serving, giving, disciplining my kids? What does God want me to do? Not what do the best books on kid discipline want me to do. What does God want me to do? You need to know God's word. If you want to know what he wants from you, you need to know his word. That's why prayer and scripture goes hand in hand. Frankly, if we want to know what, God, what a holy God wants, if we're going to pray to a holy God, we've got to spend more time listening than we actually do. And it's uncomfortable because we have a whole lot of things in our world that are there to drown out us being alone with our thoughts. But it's not just a one-time thing. We can't just consider it once and move on. We've gotta continue, we've gotta keep it up. So we've gotta continue until it's completed. Verse 11, and then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. God says, basically, you gotta keep this up until the plan is complete. And the plan's pretty rough. It's pretty challenging. The very cool thing about it is the last line, the holy seed is its stump. That's a reference to the Messiah. Out of all this desolation and destruction that you're gonna proclaim that nobody's gonna listen to, you'll also get to proclaim some amazing things. And Isaiah goes with it. Why? Why does Isaiah keep going with this? Isaiah has 59 more chapters, by the way. He keeps this up. He doesn't quit. It's because of his encounter with a holy God. That day in Isaiah 6 changes his life, and he keeps going. Even though it's hard, even though it's brutal, it fuels his ministry. And here's why. He got hope. He found hope in the temple that day or in this vision or whatever he's at. He got hope. Because God told him something's going to happen that's going to be amazing out of all this death and destruction. And you get to be a small part of it. Yeah, nobody's going to listen to you right now. But for generation after generation after generation, people will read the words of Isaiah and be filled with hope. We just spent all of December reading the words of Isaiah. For unto us a child is born. A son is given. The virgin will conceive. These are the words of Isaiah, given to him by God. And so even if his generation didn't listen, much like Van Gogh wasn't appreciated in his time, Isaiah wasn't appreciated in his. When you pray to a holy God, when you contemplate his manifold greatness, his perfections, the last thing that you get is hope. You should get some measure of hope, filled with hope, something. Because God is the only one who can fulfill his promises. God's the only one who can make those promises. And we know that in the end, it's gonna be okay. Because in the end, we wind up right back where Isaiah was, at the feet of God, worshiping and praising him and spending eternity with him. That's how the story ends. And we're not uncomfortable. We're not afraid to be there. And so you have to consider now whether or not you're being faithful. Are you sticking with it? Are you gonna quit right before the hope comes? Is there a relationship that you're thinking about giving up on? Maybe you need to stick with it. Maybe this isn't the end. Maybe there's something in your life that's just overwhelming you and you think it's the one thing God doesn't want and, and you never think you'll be set free from it. That's a lack of faith. God has a burning coal for you. He wants you to be clean. He wants you to be close to him. Maybe there's something that you were supposed to do with your life and you didn't do it. And you think that opportunity is gone. God is a God of redemption. There's always hope. The temptation as we close is to say, be like Isaiah. But there's one problem with that. 
we're all going to fail. There's going to be a moment or, or something's going to happen where, where you don't do what God's called you to do. You, you, you aren't able to keep going. You fall back into that old way of life. Something happens and you give up for a minute, maybe for a week, for a year, whatever. Isaiah can't do anything for you then. So if you're trying to be like Isaiah, you're going to fail. And there's no way out of that. Jesus is the only one who can take your failures and redeem them. He's the only one that can take our dis disappointments and bring hope. And it's because he's holy. It's because he's unique. It's because he's different. And Isaiah saw it that day. And my hope and prayer for you is that you see it today. And that because God is different, you can draw close to him. Because he's unlike anyone else you've ever met. Think about how good he is. Think about how great he is. Think about his holiness. And then think about what he wants you to do. Don't reverse that. We usually do. Don't reverse that. And be filled with hope. And keep going. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are so worth our time and our effort and our energy. And yet we give you so little. Lord, we don't know how to contemplate you. We don't know how to consider you. It seems like a big task. And frankly, we're really busy. So God, I pray that you'd forgive us for choosing lesser things, even things that are good. And I pray that this week, as we're going through our week, whether it's in the office at work or driving somewhere or in the middle of an argument, that the remembrance that our God is holy would dawn upon us and we would rejoice, be full of hope, and that we consider you. We love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name, your name that you have hallowed. It's in that name we pray. Amen.